And then 7 o'clock, a very brief and informal Advent worship service uh, with a liturgy uh, and message as we prepare room in our hearts for the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So if you are interested in bringing soup or bread, you can sign up for that out in the narthex as well. Those are my announcements. Any from the congregation before we begin worship? Then we begin with our invocation, and we begin our time of worship in the name of the one who claimed us in the waters of our baptism, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you please join me in singing our gathering hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns? It's number 222, verses 1, 2, 5, and 6. Please rise as you are able. Savior, 
Amen. People of God, you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, poured out for you in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Hear the promise first given in your baptism. You are God's child. Your sins are forgiven. Rejoice and be glad, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Dear friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. <laughs> Thank you. 
refuge and strength of very present help and trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is the river whose streams may glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in her midst. She shall not be moved. God will help her the morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 11 through 20. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear friends, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God our Father 
and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. There is something significant in being remembered when someone we care about remembers us on our birthday with a phone call, when a wife receives an out of the blue bouquet of flowers from her husband, when a father keeps the promise that he made to his children, when you receive a Christmas card from a long lost friend that you had lost contact with a long time ago. But I suppose if there is great significance in being remembered, there is also great heartache that comes with being forgotten. A feeling that all of us have known a time or two in our lives. As a child, when you're left off the invitation list for a child who's having a birthday party in your home room. When the grandkids forget to stop by like they said they would. When a special date, such as an anniversary, is glossed over. My parents once left me at Walmart in Watertown, South Dakota, and even though to this day they say that it was an accident, <laughs> I do not believe them. Being remembered, what an amazing feeling, a significant feeling, but being forgotten, what a difficult feeling, like being kicked in the gut. Our gospel text this morning seems a little out of place. In a time of the year when we should be thawing our Thanksgiving turkeys and unwrapping the spools of Christmas lights in the garage, it feels a little bit more like Lent, and we think that perhaps we should be hiding plastic eggs and setting out our Easter lilies. And yet today is Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday of the church year, the bridge that leads us into Advent. Beginning next Sunday, we will embark on our journey to Bethlehem. But before we start singing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and preparing our hearts for the coming of the Christ child, we have to remember on this Christ the King Sunday, why it is that child came at all. As we meet Christ this morning, it's nearing 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Good Friday. Some six hours earlier, his hands and feet had been nailed to a cruel tool of Roman execution. And for these six hours, perhaps the longest and most agonizing of his 33 years on earth, Christ hung <coughs> naked for the world to see. The Romans were some of the most sadistic torturers of any age in time. The method of death known as crucifixion was unique only to them. They had invented it and reserved it for the worst of all offenses against the Roman state. You weren't crucified for stealing a pack of gum or jaywalking, but you were crucified for rebelling against the government, for murder, for high crimes that deserved a capital punishment. And on this day, to the naked eye, the average onlooker who was in Jerusalem for the Holy Week Passover festivities, for your run-of-the-mill looky-loo who knew very little about this man, Jesus Christ, it looked like business as usual. Everyone was doing what was expected of them. On the surface, it appears that the Sanhedrin, the high Jewish ruling council, and the Pharisees had done their job. They had convicted a dangerous rebel rouser of death. On the surface, it appears that Pilate and Herod, even against their better judgment, had listened to the desires of the people and handed Christ over to death. Because if Christ would not have been crucified, they would have been in danger of losing their own jobs. Or maybe their own lives. The crucifixion brigade also thought this was just Another day at the office, another low-life Jewish criminal meeting his end. Even the disciples of Jesus Christ were doing what anyone would have expected them to do. They ran. Most of them into the darkness the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane. Some of them watching the crucifixion at a distance, all to save their own skin. At first glance, if I were a gawker in the crowd who had followed the mob from the city center out to Golgotha, I would say, this is a pretty standard day. But then a few oddities begin to present themselves. 
I'm sure the execution team was used to having all sorts of obscenities from men they were driving nails into being shouted at them, cursing and begging and weeping. But what is it that Christ says as they mutilate his flesh? Father, forgive them. While most men would have used every derogatory word in the book and fight tooth and nail to escape, Jesus praise. He intercedes for those who are slain him. But is this the kind of behavior we'd expect from a king? That is, after all, what the sign above his head said, isn't it? Jesus Christ, king of the Jews. Any king that I can think of sits on a grand throne and has a staff to serve him. Any king I can think of lives in a luxurious palace, is dressed in the finest robes, and uses his authority to get ahead. A narcissist and powerful monarch who uses all their resources and every weapon in their arsenal to get what they want. So this must be a joke, right? This inscription was written to mock Christ and any of his followers who might still have some allegiance to him. This man, a king? No. And this is the snicker that rolls through the crowd on Good Friday. On top of the physical anguish that our Lord Jesus is experiencing for six hours, this was the mantra of the crowd. Kings save themselves. And indeed, this is the mantra of one of the criminals we meet who was crucified with Christ, one on each side. Each one of these men had been convicted of serious offenses. They are each guilty as charged, and yet they are very different. The first criminal looks at Christ and he sees a fraud. A pathetic man worth ridiculing with his dying breaths. The first criminal is looking for a way to wiggle out of the situation he's found himself in. He wants not to take responsibility for his own mistakes. And the only thing he wants from Christ is to get out of jail free heart. The first criminal sees a broken and a bleeding teacher. And nothing more. The second criminal, however, stands in stark contrast to the first. The second criminal re recognizes his guilt. And he not only recognizes his guilt, but he confesses it and admits fully and completely that he has earned himself a death sentence. Whereas the first criminal sees a helpless and defenseless con man, the second criminal by the power of the Holy Spirit, who gives us eyes to see and hearts to believe, sees a king. But unlike any king the world has ever known, he sees a king of reversals. A king that you and I track through the pages of the Holy Gospels, watching as he reverses the most desperate situations for the most desperate people, the man possessed by an unclean demon, the leper, the paralytic, the dead widow's son, the blind beggar. Ever since he came up out of the water of his baptism in the River Jordan, Jesus has been collecting sin and disease and sorrows and burdens and carrying them on his shoulder. What king do you know of that would do that? What king takes the imperfections, the faults, the shortcomings of his subjects onto himself and then climbs onto a cross so that they can be destroyed and put to death with him. You see, the crowd that day at Golgotha had it all wrong. They were working under the misconception that Christ came to save himself. No, no. Dear friends, Christ came to save you. Because if Christ would have pulled himself off the cross and walked away from the place called the skull that day, we would not be sitting here this morning. There would be no church. There would be no Easter morning. There would be no resurrection. 
resurrection, there would be no hope. And in fact, the announcement of the angels on that first Christmas night that a Savior had been born to us in the city of David, well, this would have been nothing more than a lie. This is what makes Jesus Christ the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords because he does what no other king in the history of all the human race has ever accomplished. He bestows the full, complete, unadulterated forgiveness of all your sins. You and I, who like the common criminals he was crucified with, have violated the law. We have fallen short of God's glory and deserve death. And not only death, but the pits of hell. But you have been remembered by God. And this is significant. Like God remembered Noah on the ark, and Abraham in his old age, and Joseph in the pit of a well, and the children of Israel in Egypt, and Naomi and Ruth and Moab, and King David after his stumbling with Bathsheba, and the exiles in Babylon, God remembers you. And, dear people here at Resurrection Lutheran Church, here is the best news that I could give you this day. He remembers not your sin, for this has been cast as far as east, is from west, but he remembers the promise he made to you with water. The same promise that Christ made from the cross, the same promise you receive today in the sacrament of the altar. You will be with him in paradise. Why? Because Jesus is king. Not just king of the Jews, not just king of creation, reversals, who is coronated on a cross of redemption and sits enthroned at the right hand of God, interceding on your behalf, waiting to welcome you home. Today, we are like criminals who have received a pardon. We are remembered. You may remain seated as we sing our hymn of the day, one of my favorites, and a good one to sing on Christ the King Sunday, Beautiful Savior, number 252 in the weekly hymnal.
this time we join together in confessing our faith as the body of Christ and we use the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. At this time, we offer our prayers for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all, whatever their need may be. Good and gracious Father, we give you thanks on this last Sunday of the church year for our King Jesus Christ, your Son, the King of Reversals. From the cross, our Lord proclaimed the message of the gospel and the mission of his church. Forgive them, Father, today you will be with me in paradise. Use your people gathered here at Resurrection and across Mankato and Minnesota and the world, that we might steadfastly lift high this cross and boldly proclaim that it is from here Satan, sin, and death are conquered forever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord of the nations, cause our civil leaders and all that you have placed in positions of authority to worship your son Jesus as king. Make our leaders, President Biden, Vice President Harris, Governor Walls, public servants everywhere, to live in the ways of justice and truth, that they might lead quiet and peaceable lives, godly in every way, working to protect the weak and the innocent. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of peace, our King sits in the glory of your presence and rules over heaven and earth with his pardon and peace. Let his pardon and peace accompany the men and women of the United States Armed Forces here at home and abroad. Fill them with honor, courage, and wisdom. Heal and strengthen the wounded. Bring our soldiers home when their task is done and give your full presence to their families awaiting the day when they return home. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father of all mercy and consolation, look with favor on all those who are in need. Fill the hungry with good things. Give to the poor and unemployed painful locations. Heal the sick, especially Ruth, Dolores, Marilyn, Paul and Donna, Warren, Ted, Carol, Lee, and Bob. Comfort those who mourn. Watch over those who travel, be near the dying. Give courage to those who suffer oppression. Defend the orphans and widows. Protect the weak, the unborn, the aging. And we remember this day all those in our own lives who stand before your throne in need of your aid in mind, body, or spirit. And we make mention of them now in the secrets of our hearts before. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In your hands, merciful Savior, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, for Jesus Christ, your dear Son, our Lord and Savior, 
who ascending above the heavens and sitting at your right hand poured out the Holy Spirit as he had promised upon his chosen disciples, causing the whole earth to rejoice. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying together,
Would you please rise to receive the benediction? Dear friends, as you have been fed by the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, go forth into your day and into your week to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ, being the body of Christ, and go forth with this benediction and blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We join in singing our sending hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, 16 in the Reclaimed Hymnal, verses 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and you may be seated as we sing it.